Steve, you recently blogged about space travel, you know, people traveling to Mars and the complexity of human biology, mm. right? Because we are, we are not crafted here. However, however we got here, whatever you believe, we're here and we are meant to live in a very narrow band on the surface of this particular planet. Mm. We have been, but we have evolved to be in tune with the gravity, mm -hmm. the, the hours in the day, the climate. You know, we, there, are, there are different types of people out there that are attuned to even their local climate. Right, even right? a little bit further, yeah. Right, so putting a human into a rocket ship, into a zero gravity situation, mm -hmm. sending them to another planet that doesn't have a breathable atmosphere, that doesn't have the same gravity, this wreaks havoc on our biology. Right. So what do you what do you think about this and what can we do in the future to mitigate some of these problems? Yeah, so it's a good question. It, you know, the the big question is should we even send people into space, right? Because right. there's the, this is a big debate, it's a debate within NASA, it's a debate among space aficionados like us. Robots versus people? Yeah, should we should should we be sending just robots into space because robots are perfectly happy in space. Yeah. yeah. They say that they come back they and they're come like, back, like I had a great time. Can I go back? I yeah. good. <laughs> um but but humans not so much. And yeah. uh, and we it's actually interesting to go through all the ways in which we are adapted to a very very particular climate uh -huh. uh, environment. So like for example, and this is also comes up a lot when you when you consume a lot of science fiction, which we do, right? Uh -huh. And I always, you know, laugh and just hey, and you just have to you would know that this is just contrived for the budget or whatever the story. Like when you go to a planet and like everything is perfect, you know, like you just walk out on the surface of the planet yeah. without it without a space suit on and you're perfectly comfortable. Earth gravity, Earth atmosphere, yeah. you know, vi you know, viruses, bacteria, like everything is if okay. You, and if you just go through just just expand the list of what is, is immediately obvious. So obviously uh, gravity is one thing. Um, another is just the, the atmospheric pressure, right? How much, you know, not just what's in the atmosphere, but the pressure, if it's too high, then it'll be oppressive or, or even crush you. If it's too low, then there's not enough, you know, oxygen to get in your lungs. There has to be enough oxygen tension, a combination of the percentage of oxygen and the pressure of the atmosphere without there being too much CO2 or anything toxic in there in mm -hmm. the atmosphere, right? So a lot of things, could mess with us. So Easily. yeah, you know, our atmosphere is mainly nitrogen and oxygen with a little bit of carbon dioxide and then trace other things. Um, so if it's, if it departs significantly from that, you would, it would be uncomfortable and increasingly uncomfortable and then incompatible with life. Mm -hmm. But then here's another one. How about just radiation from the local star, yeah. right? You know, like Mars, star. Mars doesn't have a magnetosphere, right? Well, that's a, now you're talking about, yeah, I'm talking about uh, radiation. Um, you, the two things protect us from radiation, the atmosphere and the magnetic field mm -hmm. of the earth, right? So if you're on a planet without a thick atmosphere, then the cosmic rays can come all the way in to the surface and, and bombard you. Um, and also the magnetic field protects you from like the solar wind and, and that kind of radiation. Uh, so we're nicely protected on the earth, yeah. but there's also just the sun itself, right? So it puts out a certain amount of UV rays mm -hmm. and we're adapted to that as well. If on, on a world where there was just, you just, dial up the UV light or the total brightness even a little bit, it would be really uncomfortable. Like yeah. we would be blinded or we, or we would get a sunburn being out even just for a few minutes. Imagine getting a sunburn just on your face yeah. um, just for being like one minute out in the in that environment. So the, 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 pop, the possibility that all of these variables would be in the comfort zone for, on any given other planet is like really, really Thin, right? Super not, small numbers. Not here. even every place on Earth is in the comfort zone. That's right. right? I mean, you can't hey, go too far Steve, to the poles. Or <laughs> I like my bedroom to, to be sixty-nine degrees. Yeah, I know. Right? Like I like think about just on Earth, mm. wherever you live. If you have seasonal changes, if it, if you have a winter yeah. and it gets cold, like you can't go out without right. protective gear on, which is your clothing and your right. boots. Right? Like we even on our most hospitable planet. I mean, every <laughs> time they land on a planet, there should be something. It should be too hot hot, too cold, too dry, too bright, too, too much gravity, too little, something should be off yep. or multiple things should they be off. They might be listening to country instead of rock and roll. I, <laughs> yeah, I can't yeah, you never know. Yeah. All right. So if we are going to go to these places and let's talk, we could talk about the places that are close by within our own solar system, like the moon, Mars or orbit, right? Just out in space. Yeah. Because we don't even talk about the other planets. Well, they, forget about anything else. Yeah, right? the, those are probably the closest and the most hospitable. Um, what would it take? And you now, so one approach, right? One approach is to bring Earth's environment with you, yeah. right? So 
uh, and we, we talk about this a lot as well, and we wrote about this in our book, about the fact that you need to create, uh, whether it's a station or a settlement on the moon or on Mars, you, you know, the hardest thing to deal with is the gravity, but mm -hmm. you can certainly create, you know, comfortable pressure, comfortable atmosphere, and you need environmental control. Mm -hmm. um, so there, 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 there are two things that are really hard to deal with. One is radiation and the other is gravity. Mm -hmm. um, if you're on the moon or on Mars, you know, it's, that's even harder. Ironically, there's some gravity there, but it's harder to deal with because the only way to really give you artificial gravity is with rotation, yeah. you know, and, and how are you going to do that when you're on the surface of like Mars? So you're pretty much going to have to live with the 37% of Earth's gravity on the surface of Mars, which is enough to walk around and to live, but we over, but, but biologically that's would probably not be good for our muscle Strength and our your bone, bone density, health, your yeah. bone density and whatnot. Be hard to come back to Earth after living on Mars for a couple of years. Um, in space, it's worse because there's no gravity, but then theoretically you could like be in a rotating space station where you have artificial gravity. Um, although that's a lot harder than you than you might think. It, we, would, yeah, we heard that directly from yeah. NASA. They said that you know, right they, now, like it's not even on the drawing board. Yeah. The, the technology would be too difficult. But um, theoretically, we could do it. But you would need like a very large radius, like a one mile or something radius of rotation, if you're going to create like one G without making people dizzy all the time. So it's technolo technically challenging, engineering very challenging thing, but doable. But how about the other side of the equation? So we talked about adapting the environment to us. Mm -hmm. Could we adapt to the environment? Yeah. Right. So let's think let, that's really what I was writing about. So what is the mechanism? So I think there's a couple of things you could do, right? Uh, and this is all speculation. This is all, you know, yeah. the no, theoretical. Is, it, I mean, it's a talking it's, point. As a talking point. So one thing you could do is genetic engineering. Yeah. Right. So we need to become different, different subspecies of humans that are are adapted to these other environments. So let's talk what that would be. Yeah, so one thing we could adapt to is a lower gravity, yep. right? And so that would mean like probably hormonal changes that affect the the balance of calcium in our bones. So we don't get osteoporosis mm -hmm. because of less gravity on living on Mars. Development's even harder though, because one thing it's to be it's one thing to be an adult on Mars, but if you are born on Mars and you grow up oh, out God, there, I couldn't imagine. Your development, we also were evolved to develop in 1G. Mm -hmm. And we would have to figure out a way to adapt to developing in different gravities, yeah. different gravitational fields. I've never as well. thought about that. You know, that's ha huge. Having a baby, you know, turn into a toddler, turn into a teenager, you know, like the, it, right. It, it, it there's one thing. So there, you know, in fact, there, there's one of my colleagues at Yale did this research where, um, like if you suspend rats to simulate zero G, uh, and they develop in that kind of environment where they're not experiencing gravity, uh, they like never can't walk. Like they yeah. never develop their ability to have anti gravity mm -hmm. walk because you know there there actually is an anti gravity system in your brain. Yeah. What, what I mean by that, not literal anti gravity, but I mean like your ability to maintain your posture against gravity yeah, to like stand up, physics, right, and to walk. Right? It's a physics yeah, so there, so we have reflexes, you know, in motor control that's designed to keep us upright. You yeah. know, and those systems won't develop in the absence of gravity. That's right. And that's and then once you miss your developmental window, it's gone. So mm -hmm. now you're like forever failed to adapt to a gravitational field. So to explain what you just said, there, when a child is developing, there are times during, during the, you know, it could be certain things develop earlier, yeah. certain things later. You know, if you don't develop it, when your brain is basically in that, in that zone to, yeah. to develop it. Call that a developmental window. Yeah. Right. So if you took a, if you took someone that could perfectly see normally yeah. a child and, and covered their eyes yeah. for the first five years of their life, their, the part of their brain that processes light and everything would not have developed and probably will never be able to develop. Yeah. In actually. fact, we did that experiment inadvertently, although we didn't cover both eyes. It was not uncommon to cover one eye of, of a child. You mean pirates? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, for, for children who were born with had some kind of strabismus, right? So your eyes didn't, you had a lazy eye. Mm -hmm. So they, what they would do is they would patch the strong eye to like force the lazy eye to, to do the work and to get stronger and to come together and then it was it, they discovered after doing this for a while that those children never developed binocular vision because they missed their window yeah and you can't do that so now of course we don't do that yeah but that's exactly what you were talking about though um so yeah so there so that's another issue is like how do we deal with developmental windows in alien environments how do we deal with lo low gravity um and 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 there, you know you can conceive of certain genetic 
tweaks that we could do to make it easier. And this is part of the research that's going ongoing. Like uh, NASA is doing this research aboard the International Space Station mm -hmm. so that we can at least identify physiologically what are the issues. Our eyes, our eye pressure isn't managed well in zero gravity. Like right. The fluids in our body, like we can't, our body needs to be in 1G and, and uh, we would need to evolve to adapt to other gravities, but we could accelerate that through genetic engineering. Another, well, the thing I read, we talked about this on ASGU yeah. at one point, that tardigrades have a really good ability to deal with radiation. Yeah. And we, we yeah. studied them genetically and we found out why. Like there is a mechanism genetically. They, they make a protein. They make yeah. a protein that wraps around their DNA and it absorbs radiation, right? So it protects their DNA from radiation damage. Right. And it gives them about 10 times as much radiation resistance as they would otherwise have. Um, so, I mean, this is again, pure speculation, but you know, you could imagine at least in theory, you know, genetically engineering animals, whether humans or otherwise, so that they make this protein yeah. and that, that could, they could protect their DNA. And imagine if we had 10 times, the, you know, the, or, or you could look at it as one tenth the risk of cancer from radiation, from, from space radiation, yeah. which means we could, we could, we, that would extend our time that we could spend in space by 10, by a factor mm -hmm. of 10. That's, that kind of thing is theoretically possible. You could also imagine, because um, the radiation has to get through your skin, right? So if you could, uh, you know, making changes to the dermis that maybe the, there's again, proteins or whatever that would be deposited there be, that would absorb a lot of radiation. So we could basically have built in radiation protection. Now, even though we have tools like CRISPR and, yeah. you know, we, we have, some ways of doing this, like this technology is in its absolute infancy, right? Mm. We're not even close to being able to, to genetically modify people to get them to, you know, it could be, it could be a very far in the future before yeah, we, we yeah. do something like this. But it, or it's not that far, I mean, because we can do it, you know, and it, yeah, but, it, it but depends. Just, but knowing exactly what to do. Yeah. Right? I'm saying CRISPR can do it. Yeah. But, you know, when you make a modification to someone's genes, there could be fallout somewhere else. It there's could, a there's a lot of research that would need to be done before we would do this to people, yeah. certainly, you know. But you know, there's something that we, we didn't talk about, but I think it's very obvious here. These people mm. in, are not choosing this, right? Would you have to do this to a child? Well, not necessarily. You could so, do it to an adult, you, so, okay. There, there are some kind of changes you could do to an ad adult. Like if you just need to make a protein in your body, giving you the genes to do that are possible. Mm -hmm. And you could even do what we call somatic, you know, uh, gene transfer. So that, in other words, it's not affecting your germline. So you wouldn't pass it on to future generations. It's a change that only affects you. Right. So that's, that certainly is a bit more ethically and technologically easier, you know, to, to do with or safer. If you make changes to the germline, that could be more powerful, right? Because now you're affecting the whole organism and their development, but you're also affecting their children mm -hmm. and you're introducing those genes into the gene pool, the, the greater population. So the regulation, a lot of current and emerging regulation is focusing on the germline right. because that's the one that's like, you can't pull that back. That's like, that's letting the genie out of right. the bottle. So it's, but, it's, if, it's, but if it's just a, the individual person, if it stops with them, that's, a, that's obviously less risky. Yeah, but you're saying it's not as powerful. It wouldn't be as... It depends on the... app. It's not as powerful and therefore it depends on the application. So something like the skin, which is turned over regularly, I could see how that wouldn't be that hard to do. It's like give your fibroblasts or whatever, a genetic mutation. So they make, they incorporate a new protein into your skin within a couple of months, you'll probably incorporate it into a lot of your skin and there you go, you yeah. know? Uh, but if you wanted to change like the structure of your brain, you got to get in on the baby level, right? Or, right. The, or earlier, like you, that's something you need to do, you know, probably to the egg. Yeah. 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 That's a big deal. And you know, there's a, there are more impl moral implications there. So that's just the genetic mutations, right? That's just, just, that's just CRISPR or whatever. That's just, can we genetically modify humans to have specific adaptations to the harsh environment mm -hmm. of space? Another option would be cyborg implants. Of course. Right. Yeah. So you I mean, know, we are starting, look, we, we the, yeah. the, when the first patient got that, uh, you know, um, Elon Musk's company. Oh, the Neuralink. The Neuralink thing. thing. I mean, it's, they were not, not even the first company. No, to do there's that. 40 companies that do this. No, not 40. This. There's a few. Oh, I just read it. There's there's companies and I mean, there's only a few companies that have actually implanted in a human. Yeah, there's a lot of companies that are working on working on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, 
so yeah, so what kind of cyborg implants could adapt people to space? You know, yep. that's an interesting question as well. So there might be, again, there might be uh, implants that might help with radiation or help repair the damage. That's the other thing. Not only you could block radiation, you could repair the damage from radiation, more robust DNA repair, for example, or maybe flush it out of your body, you know, if you get exposed to, you know, radio radioactive particles. Mm -hmm. um, so like when you get like, you know, the thyroid pills, the like the, the iodine pills, the whole point of that is to sort of keep radioactive iodine from getting taken up by your thyroid. Yep. So that's just a way of physiologically sort of keep protecting yourself from radioactive okay. particles. But for space radiation, it's more about blocking cosmic rays and solar rays. Uh, and so you know, there you could have you know, implants that could physically protect you or mop up the radiation or repair damage you know from yeah. the radiation you could have an exoskeleton exoskeletons then you're you're almost getting to spacesuit level you know which yeah. which is basically like a little mini space station just for one person you know um but yeah i mean anything on that realm or um you know it, uh, the ability to concentrate oxygen from the air so you could survive in lower oxygen environments or lower oxygen tension yeah. environments or protecting your lungs from you know, from either too high or too low pressure or too high or too low humidity or I mean, all the, these things. The variables here are huge. There's and so then you talk about gravity. That's where I think the exoskeletons, you know, you basically you could either, you know, put implants in your bones so they don't snap, but you might also need muscle assists if you have a high gravity situation, mm -hmm. right? So that could come into play as well. Yeah, you know, there, there could also be a blending of these ideas. Of course, right? these are not mutually exclusive. You yeah. could be genetically engineered and have a couple implants. So I think if, you know, if we're going to have humans permanently living in space, these things are going to have to be done to some extent, yeah, right? I agree. It's going to be weird. Yeah. It's going to be weird, man. They might not, you know, there might be physical alterations that yeah uh, yeah i just think this is literally like a science fiction story at this point right it, at this point it really is and like the final level which is i think the most advanced is where like we are not we we um have to have some way of, of like the swapping out our whole body right mm -hmm. so how do we do that so that would be like some kind of neural link to a robot mm -hmm. where like you're safely on board like a, a space surrogate. station, yeah. you know, like a surrogate. And if you need to go into the harsh environment, then you just take control, you know, physically of a robot to yeah. do it. And there's different ways that could happen. Um, you know, you could always have your brain implanted into a robot yeah, if you wanted luck. a more permanent That's solution. Tough. That's tough. Yeah. Or the like digitizing, you know, your consciousness, which isn't, it's, it's you know, I, I always emphasize it's making a copy of you. It's not moving you, but if we needed to, Want, if we wanted humans to be occupying a space, we could like make a copy of yourself, put that copy into a computer, into a robot, and they can you know go on the mission. Or not even just a a robot, a, a genetically engineered life form that's adapted to that world, mm -hmm. like you know, Avatar. Like Avatar. Yeah. That's the Avatar thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it does slip very quickly into science fiction type thinking. Yeah. But you know, I mean, like we don't know the upper limits of what human technology are. Yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. We can't. You know, we can't. We can't predict what's going to happen five years from now. So. <laughs> you're right I, not yeah not completely of course so so, so steve yeah. would you would you undergo any of these genetic alterations yourself i w i mean you know at, at the older i get or the closer i get to the end of my life the less of a downside there is you know what i mean yeah. it's like, like when when you're pretty much of like the retirement age i'd be, much, be be willing to do a lot of things that I wouldn't do as a 20 year old, right, yeah, you know what I mean? Case, yeah. Like, would you do a one way trip to Mars? Yeah. If it was like the end of my life and you know, I'd spend the last couple of years of my life on Mars or whatever. Um, I would consider stuff like that, but yeah, I wouldn't do that personally. I probably I, wouldn't do that. I mean, you would be basically saying you'll never have a good meal again. Yeah. Right. No more, yeah, yeah. you know, homemade food. Forget it. <laughs> forget it. That's basically, I'm going to lean into uh, eating when I'm older. That's what, that's what, <laughs> I, that's my retirement plan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Steve, thank you. I feel now um, that we have set up the very beginning of mm. a human against human war, mm. right? Because you're going to have like the... Subspecies the of humans. Yep. Right? It'll be the Belters versus the Martians versus the Earthers. Yeah, the purebloods or whatever you want to yeah. call them. Yeah, it'll happen. <laughs>